This is David Dubal, and I'm glad to be talking to you about music. And we're going to have Brahms, Bach, Alexander Cherepnin, Morton Gould, Mendelssohn, and a little Stravinsky on this program of piano music. All these recordings have not yet been heard on the station, and I think that we will enjoy them. One of the most wonderful pianists, really a great artist, is Thomas Vachery, born around 1932 in Hungary. He left in 1956, when many Hungarians did, and he has been living in London as his base of operations. I've interviewed him several times, and I know him quite well as a person totally out of the ordinary. Music is one aspect of a very spiritual being, and Vachery is a sensitive artist if he is anything. He thinks, he is involved with philosophy, with his dreams, with thinking, with walking, with having a wonderful time, and there is no more passionate conversationalist than Thomas Vachery. He can go on for hours on um, topics that, well, he's just happy to be communicating. And he communicates with his playing as his prime area. He also now conducts a great deal. We're going to hear from a DG album, the Capriccio, Opus 76, number one, by Johannes Brahms. Listen to the depth of his interpretation.
You have just heard the Brahms Capriccio in D minor played by the Hungarian pianist Tomasz Vasari from a DG album, and it is really something wonderful playing Brahms in his special arpeggiation. His way of writing for the piano was, is so rich, so beautiful. This is Opus 76, so it was composed around 1874. Let's now listen to Vasari, who is very, very happy and very pleased with this recording. I think he said to me that this was one of the few recordings that he truly was happy with. Let's hear the Intermezzo Opus 76, number 6. such depth of feeling, the intermezzo of Brahms, Op. 76, in Vasari's hands. Such a beautiful work. Brahms wrote in his later years only small pieces for the piano. His early years held the sonatas, Op. 1, 2, the gigantic one in F minor, Op. 5. And then he went in Opus 10 to the Ballades, and of course his incredible sets of variations, his two great piano concertos. But finally in his older years, his later years, he gravitated to 
very, very beautifully structured pieces, sometimes in sonata form, called intermezzi, all complicated, very cerebral, actually, and yet with such depth of feeling. He would send one or two of them to Clara Schumann, and he would say, these are the cradle songs of my old age. Or he would tell her, play these for only yourself, for even one is too many. Always the Brahms literature has been difficult to translate to the public outside of the big works and the Brahms Handel variations. These small pieces are difficult to bring off in a concert hall. Such playing as Vacherie's is absolutely so soul-searching. Let's hear them now in a different Brahms, the Brahms heaven-storming and yet so totally structured. It is a major sonata f movement that he calls Rhapsody. It's in G minor and it's famous. Vashari the Pianist. <laughs> Thank you. 
G minor Rhapsody of Brahms, Opus 79, number 2. The artist, Tomasz Vashari. Obviously not the usual performance of the Rhapsody. Very introspective, very mysterious, very different than the usual heaven-storming reading. Vashari was very pleased with this recording. He told me that, and uh, I now understand him. Let's take a break for a message or two, and we will be back with some Bach. This is David Dubal, and we just heard Thomas Vachery play Brahms. One of the three Bs is Bach. Ah, but first, yes, I want to invite you to my class, the Extension Division, the Juilliard School. It's called The World of the Piano, and it begins September 10th. And I did this class last year, and it was very, very much fun, I think, for all of the people who took it as well. It's on Wednesdays at 5.30 to 6.45, and each week we discuss a different aspect of the title of the course, which is The World of the Piano. And often I have guests, and I have had some very famous guests there, John Browning and Ruth Laredo and many others, and we talk about the problems of careers, and we listen to some very special recordings, and we hear the guests play, and we talk, and we have a good time. If you're really interested in this, and I hope you are, uh, Juilliard, of course, is at Lincoln Center. You can write for a catalog, and it's uh, Lincoln Center, New York 10023, the Juilliard School, or you can call 799 Five thousand and registration for the extension division and my course, the world of the piano, is um, Tuesday, September second. It's nine thirty a.m. to twelve thirty p.m. and then in the afternoon, one thirty to seven thirty. There's also a late registration, Saturday, September sixth, ten a.m. to one p.m. I would love to have you take this course. We had a wonderful time last semester, and I am looking forward to doing this again. It's each Wednesdays at 5.30 to 6.45, often to 7. We have Chopin, and we have Brahms, and we have guest artists. Wanda Landowska was certainly the high priestess of the harpsichord probably one of the most incredible musicians of the 20th century. She brought the Goldberg variations to the knowledge of the public. She brought the very sound of the harpsichord, although not the kind of harpsichord that we hear as much today. She had a marvelous Playel harpsichord, quite a grand thing. And she um, played the piano, of course, wonderfully. But on the harpsichord, she found... Her keyboard instrument, as very few people ever found anything. We're going to hear, and it's a um, fairly new mastering of her old recording of the second partita, as well as two-part inventions in the Fantasy in C minor, which we will now hear her play. Uh, she says the autograph, 1738, of this fantasia is in Dresden. It would be important for every interpreter to know it because it reveals the method of executing certain ornaments which Bach, instead of indicating them by signs, wrote out in notes. This case is rare in Bach's work and an eloquent lesson. The fantasy can be played on the modern piano, but the passages for crossed hands obviously call for the two keyboards of the harpsichord. The character of this fantasia is stormy. The two voices run, sometimes in contrary motion, sometimes together, sometimes they clash and interweave. Magnificent effects intended for the two keyboards. Let's hear this recording produced back in 1959 by uh, John Pfeiffer and uh, remastered recently on RCA, the artist, the legendary Wanda Landowska.
You have just heard the wonderful, passionate performance of the C minor fantasy of Bach, J.S., in the hands of Wanda Landowska, one of the great keyboard musicians, certainly of this century, probably of all time. What passion she has. This is David Dubal, and we're going to be listening to a work by Alexander Cherepnin in a minute. But again, I want to invite you to the extension division of the Juilliard School, where I teach a course called The World of the Piano. And I just so much want it filled up. It's every Wednesday, 5.30 to 6.45. And for more information, uh, write to the Juilliard Extension Division, Lincoln Center, 10023, or call them at 799-5000. The registration is September 2nd, 9.30 a.m. to 12.30. And it's a fantastic course. Um, These classes are designed primarily for persons with a limited background in classical music to broaden the knowledge and aesthetic appreciation of music. All courses include performances in class and optionally attended free recitals and concerts at Juilliard. Well, it's a wonderful class, and I had such fun doing it last year, and I just want everyone who wants to take it to know about it. So I am trying. Let's listen to a composer who is today recognized as a very important Russian-born composer who lived in America, an excellent pianist, and his name, Alexander Cherepnin. He was born 1899, and he died in 1977. And this is a new recording on the label, etc. Very good label. It's a digital stereo, etc. 1033, if you want to buy it at Tower Records. And it's performed by a most brilliant American pianist who loves to play not only the great repertoire, the grand repertoire, who has played in concert the Debussy etudes and the preludes and so forth, and Beethoven sonatas and Schumann's large works, but he also was a wonderful programmer and he loves to bring novelties to our attention. He has recorded on etc. a fine album of American piano music, Virgil Thompson, Samuel Barber, Paul Bowles, many others. And this is an Alcherepnin album. And on it are various small pieces, um, the marvelous Opus 88, eight pieces for piano, as well as a sonatine romantique. The pianist, if I just didn't mention his name, is Bennett Lerner. And indeed, on October 7th at WNCN Live, you'll be able to hear Mr. Lerner in a recital at WNCN 1186 Avenue. This is a sonatine romantique, Opus 4, an early work, 1918. That was a tumultuous period in music, difficult period in some ways. It's a three-movement work and shows Cherepnin's extraordinary grasp of the piano, and yet there is a certain quality here that is his own. So many people have said, well, he sounds like Prokofiev. Well, this is part of him, but he has something very much of his own aesthetic. Let's listen to the young American pianist Bennett Lerner in Cherepnin's Sonatine Romantique, Opus 4, 1918.
You have just heard the Opus 4 by Alexander Cherepnin, 1899-1977, the Sonatine Romantique, composed in 1918, later revised. And you heard a wonderful performance on an etc. recording, 1033, by the American pianist Bennett Lerner. Mr. Lerner is called by Claudio Arau, who he studied with, a wonderful pianist among the best of his generation. I remember last November hearing a f wonderful performance of the Copeland Piano Concerto conducted by Meta at Avery Fisher Hall as a celebration for Copeland's 85th birthday. Uh, Lerner has also recorded a All-American album, which includes music by Barber and Bernstein and Bowles. Those are the three B's of American music. Copeland, Philip Ramey's Fantastic Fantasy, and Virgil Thompson pieces. This whole album is like a survey of the whole career of Cherepnin pianistically, uh, more or less going from uh, 1918 through 1955. Well, it's a composer that we really should know more of. He is neglected. And I'm so glad that this etc. recording is now out. That was actually a WNCN premiere. Right after this message, we will have more music. This is David Dubal, and we have heard Bach, Cherepnin, and uh, we began with Vashari playing Brahms. I again want to invite you to attend my classes each Wednesday, 5.30 to 6.45, it's part of the extension division of the Juilliard School. Call them at 799-5000 for information. I really would love this class to be packed with people. We have guests each week, and we talk about the piano literature, and we have uh, many performances. It's at 5.30 to 7, 6.45. I am the instructor, David Dubal, and it's... Um, they are well. They're de designed. It says the brochure, brochure here for uh, the layman and non-professional. So you don't have to know anything to come. You just have to want to. Let's listen to. Um, oh well, you know I'm reading this wonderful book as I was coming here on the bus. I just bought it. It's called The Human Situation. Aldous Huxley, and it has so many fantastic things in it. Uh, many, many essays, uh, lectures that he gave in 1959 at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And uh, I was reading this. Oh, hey, look at... But in fact, there are only two species of creatures which make war. One is the harvester ant, and the other is the human being. These two creatures have in common the institution of property. The harvester ants... From one nest collect large quantities of foodstuffs. The members of a neighboring nest come in genuine armies and fight for the possession of these foodstuffs. In spite of the fact that harvester ants do not possess a language and therefore have no conceptual system of principles or ethical notions, these wars can last for a considerable time. Some have been observed to last for as much as five or six weeks, which is a very long time for an animal without a language system to keep a war going. This is from his um, essay called War and Nationalism. It's a book called The Human Situation. This is from How Original is Original Sin. Um, he says that uh, one of the most important things is the enormous genetic variability among human beings. One consequence of the fact of variability is that liberty is a very precious thing. After all, if we were all the same, then there would be no point in liberty. What would be good for one would be good for all. It is human variability, the fact that one man's meat is another man's poison, that imposes upon us 
the duty of preserving individual liberty and of encouraging tolerance, of preventing majorities from repressing minorities, of permitting people to have a measure of self-determination in their lives. This whole book is just filled, it's called The Human Situation, filled with this great mind that was Huxley's. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed that, and we're going to go back to music. Arthur Rubinstein very much wanted a piece from Stravinsky, and so Stravinsky wrote him the piano rag music. Stravin uh, Rubinstein, the romantic pianist, heard it and said, What? My public will not like this. This is ridiculous. This is dissonant. This is, this is difficult. Do something from your ballet, Petrushka. Transcribe it so... Stravinsky went back to their workroom and produced a f three scenes from Petrushka. We're going to hear just Dance Rus, played by the extraordinary pianist. I mean, there's no other word for him. Shura Tcherkoski. Everything he touches is different. He is not predictable. Let's hear Dance Rus, Shura Tcherkoski, who studied with Joseph Hoffman. He was born, I think, in 1912 in Odessa. You just heard the first movement from Three Movements of Petrushka by Stravinsky, played by someone so unusual, Shura Tchaikovsky. We usually hear that movement so fast and fleeting and percussively. No, we heard much 
more. We heard a slower performance. We heard all the strands and all of the, well, it's the ballet. It's not just a virtuoso piece. Shura Tchaikovsky is an extraordinary man. I've met him once, and it was absolutely a delight in every way, knowing him. He's totally modest, and he's a great artist who keeps developing year in and year out. We're going to hear him play Boogie Woogie Etude by Morton Gould. Morton Gould is a great friend of American music and one of the foremost composers of American music. An entertaining man. He has composed so much music that most of the time he doesn't even know where it is. Oh, I said, do you have a copy of your sonatina? I love the piece. Oh, do I? I, I wonder. Well... Months later, he sends me a copy. He actually found it. He looked for it, and uh, he doesn't even remember usually what he does because he's a man that really lives in the moment. Morton Gould is now president of ASCAP, and I guess he's had every distinction possible. Shura Tcherkoski has long played this boogie-woogie etude. It's a lot of fun. Let's hear this great pianist who lives in London play boogie-woogie etude by Morton Gould. Thank you. Great romantic pianist Shura Tchaikovsky trying his hand at Boogie Woogie Etude by Morton Gould. A piece that must be very much fun to play, certainly fun to listen to. I've had a good time playing these recordings tonight, and we have heard Shura Tchaikovsky, we have heard Bennett Lerner, we have heard Vashari, and the immortal Landowska. Join me next time. This is David Dubal. Thank you for listening.